point in the city down by the harbor. And we did it over two days with a lot of boring stuff for the first couple hours. So lo and behold, people did show up for the first couple hours and then kind of went away. And the 15 of us were able to have our first ever kind of heart-to-heart -heart discussion about what we wanted to do in the city. And universally, we came up with three things that were focused on this. Public safety, especially youth development and gang violence. Housing and the issue of homelessness and affordable housing. And third, tra traffic and transportation, which of course touches everybody's lives. We spent two days um, last month, another day this month, where for the first time, instead of reacting to all of the legislation and the reports and everything that comes to City Council, we vote on probably about 150 items a week, we decided to be proactive and say, what do we want to do with each of these subject areas to be proactive, to get the after school programs that can keep kids out of gangs, to begin to really put together a transportation plan that will work for this city, to build housing to get people off of our streets, um, and to finally turn around the lives of people who live with drug addiction or substance abuse, and also, you know, many of them veterans, about 50% of our homeless on Skid Row are veterans, um, have mental disabilities as well that go completely untreated because we have no place to put them anymore. How can we do that so that we can truly become a great city today? I believe that we have the power to change the city for future generations. I've seen it with my eyes, I've seen it in my district. I've seen Hollywood, our most famous um, neighborhood, our calling card to the world, emerge from a place where we used to only see drug dealing and prostitution and gangs to a place we can be proud of again. Hollywood Boulevard, we have movie stars who are moving back into the old Broadway there at Hollywood and Vine, which has been now made into luxury lofts. And we have two or three movie stars who just decided to move back to Hollywood and Vine. And they can go see a movie at, at the Arclight Cinema, uh, where the Cinerama Dome is. They can go and see Wicked, the play that's over at the Pantages. They can go to a farmer's market on Sunday. They can take a subway to the Valley or downtown to meet friends. They can go out to wonderful nightclubs and restaurants again, all without having to get into a car. To live the life that we want to have the option, not always to discard the car, but instead of using it 100% of the time, maybe we can use it 90 or 80 or 70% of the time. My favorite statistic about traffic in, in Los Angeles is that we have 1.1 passengers on average in each of our cars, just 1.1 passengers. If we had 1.6 passengers on average, traffic would flow again in Los Angeles. So in other words, if every other car just had two people in it, if we carpooled a little bit more, not a big sacrifice, we would have uh, the resolution of the traffic back to the way the streets were actually built. In my office, I mandate that everybody who's my employee carpool, take a bike, take a bus, or walk to work at least once a week. Not every day, just once a week. And it's been wonderful. We're actually quantifying how many miles of traffic we're taking off the street, how much pollution we're taking out of the air. Issues like graffiti, which are seemingly intractable. In this district, nothing drove me crazier than graffiti. Not only because it made a neighborhood so unattractive and said to people that it's not your neighborhood, it's the gang's neighborhood, but also because it led to the loss of life. We have taggers, people who make graffiti, who are putting graffiti up and other tagging gangs come and crossing that out and then shooting at each other and we've lost young people simply over that. And so I asked my staff to look at how much tagging we have in the city, in our district, and we spent an entire day counting every single graffiti tag on every block of every street of every neighborhood in our district. In one day in June, we counted 20,754 tags on every light post and bus stop and on the sidewalk and etched into glass and everywhere. And we said, how can we design something where we give a little bit of sacrifice to make a really big impact? And we recruited over the next two years over 300 block captains and we gave me more resources to preventing graffiti and putting cameras up in strategic locations, to getting city crews to paint the graffiti out as quickly as it comes up, and to ask people to just adopt one block so that they could do this for the long haul. And immediately when they see it, to call 311, which is the city's non-emergency number, 24 hours a day, and to get it painted out. And every year, the same day, the same methodology, we count the tags, and this year, we were down to 7,766, sorry, 6,677 tags, which is still too many, but a 68% drop in just a few years. With a small sacrifice, we can do big things. And I hope that's what the city council is beginning to do. I hope that it is something that Angelinos are willing to do. Because we have the best potential, I believe, of any city in the 21st century. 45% of all the goods in America come through our ports. We have more than three dozen countries that have their largest population outside those countries here. 
from Armenia to, we just welcomed the new consul general from Israel today. This is the second largest Jewish city. We have Koreans and Thais and Guatemalans. This is the second largest Mexican city, including all the cities in Mexico, after Mexico City. These are things that should make us great and strong and powerful, and yet we have to utilize that with a vision for the future. And for me, it's moving the city forward, it's making sure that we have a safe city for our young people, and it's housing our city in a way that we can really sustain that growth that we face. So I want to thank you for all that you've contributed to making this a great city. I want to thank you for daring to dream in this Los Angeles that we can rebuild that. And I hope to be your partner in that. Um, I know that for my family, when they came to the Heights a few generations ago, they would never have imagined how this city grew. They probably never imagined what would have happened to their family. But the city has been so great to us. I know it's been so great to you. And I hope for the next generation we can make it just as great as well. Thank you very much. I have one comment, and that is, I only wish that when I was growing up and graduating from Roosevelt High School, I could have afforded a little lawsuit. <laughs> I got one more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody got any? Yeah, I read about where they're going to take people in the Olympic and make a one-way street. Is that something they're really going to do? Um, what the mayor announced with uh, members of the city council, including Wendy Gruel, who is our uh, great transportation chair, is that instead of making it completely one-way streets, because it's tough on the businesses and it's tough on the residents, because if you miss if you miss the place you went, you have to go all the way around through the neighborhoods, is to make them predominantly one-way. So people have talked a long time, and we've seen this successfully, whether it's the Dodger games or other places, where you reverse the lanes depending on the time of day. And so the mayor has crafted with the council a plan to essentially say, let's time the lights so that people can go more smoothly through Pico and Olympic, but that uh, three quarters of the street essentially would be this direction during rush hour when most cars are there, and vice versa. I think we're all frustrated when we're in two lanes of traffic and we see all the cars piled up and empty lanes right next to us, or you know, only a few cars. So they're going to test that. It's done much more cheaply as well. To make it completely one way, streets would probably be tens of millions, and this is 1.5 million dollars is what we're estimating. So I think it's a good way to test it. Any suggestion with anything with traffic immediately breeds a lot of fear. Because while people hate the present, they fear the future even more. Um, so I, I want to, you know, I would say it's really important for us to test it, to not say this is written in stone, but let's see if it, if it works. And if it does, I think that's something we can be doing with some of our north-south streets too, that really paralyze us because, you know, we, we are trapped in those cars, going from one light to the next, the next, the next, um, and we see unutilized lanes that are right next to us. Harry, you have a question. The Jewish Community Center at uh, Solon, Michigan was locked down without any permits. Yeah. Well, how did they do that? Well, it was in, it was in violation. Um, the Jewish Community Center that was knocked down, uh, that was in violation of, of uh, the city law, and they unfortunately went after and did something called scorched earth, which means that that person can't build something after that. But it's too late once it's down, which is unfortunate. We passed the law because of that and one other thing of the scorched earth ordinance that essentially says there was one last home, for instance, that was down by um, Sunset and, and Figueroa, that something similar happened. And any developer who does that can't build in the city for a, a, a series of, of years. So it's a real strong way of stopping it. But unfortunately, once it's down, it's down. And they want to put the social security building. Yeah, and I, I, believe that, I believe they're still being able to build that, but I, I don't know exactly. I should, Councilmember Wiesar, who's the representative now in the area, I know called that very closely and tried to do what he could after the fact, but once it was down, it was down. And that's a way that, to prevent for the future, but so much of Los Angeles, I mean, whether it's the Brown Derby in, in Hollywood, um, you know, I worked very hard on the Palladium. Everybody has a story probably of seeing great band at the Palladium through all the generations, multiple generations. And that was threatened with the wrecking ball as well. And what we've tried to do is with our historic buildings, we're now doing an inventory of the entire city with the Getty Foundation. And, and then when we have all of them, we mark them so that our planning department and our building and safety department, who are the ones who issue the permits for demolition, would have an, a historical flag, essentially, when somebody would come in and say, I'm going to knock that down. They would say, no, you can't. This is a historical building. It has to go through a much longer process. 
and put the brakes on because so much of our the city we lost overnight when we should have been preserving it. So this technology should help that um, not happen in the future, but it was a great tragedy. Will there be a sign, when is this Pico Olympic business, one way? Is, are there gonna be signs when and what from the freeway exits or on, you know, Yes, uh, getting off they will make the head. signage as clear as possible because it could be very dangerous if you don't. Yeah. Uh, and there will be, a, I think what they're looking at right now, they, they tested some of the lights already to see what it would be like to have more accelerated Where, lights. With the lights along the Pico? Yeah, I'm uh, happy to give you my card and we can follow up when it comes closer to that. Okay. Take a, one more question. Uh, the, uh, the traffic, one of the things that concern me because to get out of the Palestine is impossible. Go east of the Union. There's just no way out. They're talking about the fact that between Sentinel Arts and the of Rea, they're going to save seven minutes by going through this. And the point is, seven minutes will be eaten up in the Buddy Weber has been very much involved. One of the officers who I met at a luncheon that Mickey Mason and I attended at USC for the Alumni Association is here. I'd like to introduce to you Candy Tanamachi. <laughs> uh, Gil Ontiveros is Gil around. Also a member of the Alumni Foundation. Please be with the judges here today. Okay, I'm going to turn this. Uh, Tibor Rubin was presented the Congressional Medal of Honor. We have a video. I don't know how well you can see it, but you'll certainly be able to hear the audio, I hope, I hope uh, which focuses on this, the history of this period and um, we want you to pay attention to it. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how long a few of the lights are. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Laura Bush. I'd like to invite you to join me in a moment of prayer. <laughs> 